Hi there students, uh, this is Miss Wilson and I am creating another voiceover video for you to help with interpretation of radiographic images and um, this is another series that was shared with me from Dr. John Priest, my radiology instructor actually. And y'all, please excuse me if I call for I sound kind of funny today. I got kind of a little bit of a cold, so I'm trying to get this made for you before we break for the holidays. So here we go. Um, like I said, it is another review for you that was shared um, to help students learn. And this happens to be an image that I've taken, actually. I love to share some pictures with you. This was taken in Austria one time when we were traveling, and I just I love um, flowers as we go around. I do a lot of that. So again, Dr. John Priest, he was the uh, Director of Dental Diagnostic Sciences and Radiographic Interpretations for um, dental hygiene students and dental students, actually, the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. So we're going to talk about radiographic images and how we develop strategies to learn to um, read images and that can be somewhat of a challenge sometimes but the strategy that you need to do is just very simple you just need to have a very focused approach to looking at radiographic images and you're always just going to describe what you see so in radiology you deal with images of black and white basically in varying shades of gray so you have radiolucency which is a black to a medium gray or radio opaque which is a white to light gray and then a mixed uh, representation of the two and where is it located you always start off by describing radiolucent image or lesion apparent in the maxilla adjacent to tooth number 32 or uh, located near those types of uh, description so what does it look like you always describe in a structured method again let's go back one more time you start with what color it is where it is what does it look like and what are normal structures are associated with the abnormality so is it near something where is it located you're trying to actually develop map coordinates for the doctor to be able to see so that's why you have to use very standardized words such as circumscribed corticated non-corticated poorly defined those types of words that um, you're going to be using so continuing on you're looking at other characteristics that can be associated with this abnormality the things that you need to keep in mind is that it, anytime you evaluate a patient it's typically done with clinical findings along with radiographic findings and if that is the case you're always going to coordinate the two together swelling and expansion how do you know that so that's why you're learning intraoral and extraoral examinations because you know what normal will feel like so when you notice abnormal that's when the light bulb should go off and that's why you palpate like for example in this situation on this slide it's talking about swelling and expansion if you notice a radiolucency or a opacity that's associated with like say the lower left mandible is it palpable and is it within the normal ranges of um, palpation or is it expanded those are very critical findings when you're doing an uh, extra oral and intraoral examination for cancer um, think three-dimensionally as well is it located within the jaw and could it be superimposed that means is it in the bone structure or is it soft tissue related superimposed over the bone you're dealing with a two-dimensional image where you have lost the depth of things so you have to look at things realistic that's why I've told you before that you'll have um, it's almost like the steamroller effect when you have a flattened image but yet all the characteristics in anatomy are present they're just stacked on top of one another 
So how do you draw conclusions from what we've seen then? You typically generally categorize a, or an abnormality as a malignant, benign, infectious, congenital, inherited only. Now we as hygienists really can't determine, nor can a doctor, just a routine general dentist, unless there's a biopsy that's taken place, determine if things are malignant or benign. You, those are uh, based upon uh, biopsies that are, are retrieved from a doctor themselves. So we're looking for suspicious areas that are located or and or abnormal, out of the normal. So beginner's guide to radiographic interpretation for caries classifications. So there's periodontal signs or easy, uh, excuse me, early signs for uh, or progress of alveolar bone loss and um, common radiographic anomalies. So anomalies or could be they're not at, they're not pathology, but they're abnormal. So sometimes we just talk about stuff. And if there's stuff, it kind of falls within that other realm of uh, anomalies that may be present that could have been caused from some kind of congenital issue or something. So what does normal look like? Well, here we have a great normal radiographic image that is depicting the correct anatomy, horizontal bite wing with all open interproximal spaces. We have all of the characteristics that we're looking for. We're looking for the distals of the canines, first premolar, second premolar, first molar, which the mandibular happens to be missing, second molars. And as you can see, this mandibular second molar has mesially inclined or migrated towards the opening that used to have a full-size first molar in this image. So you'll also see how this tooth is tipping. Those can be issues when we have a patient that's lost a tooth over time. Um, Again, open interproximal spaces where you see these um, very lucent or dark areas in between. That's what you're looking for because if you have something that's overlapped in an area, it's very difficult to determine if it's decay or not. So we have, again, this is number 11, which is the patient's upper left side, lower left side. So number 11. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 would be the third molar, 17 would be a third molar, we have number 18, and number 19 is missing, 20, 21, and 22. So you have to know the numbers radiographically as well so that you can present your dental charting in those aspects. Um, we have amalgam restorations in this image as well. They're very uh, cut, you know, uh, traditionally kind of old style cut uh, prep is what we're going to say. This is also one thing, an image that you want to take a look at for quality in itself. This is actually a scanned image of a phosphor plate. And phosphor plates are wonderful apparatus to use. However, this one's been used a little too much. Do you see all the, the scratchy, uh, kind of pitted looking all over the image? That means this plate has been used too many times. Typically, phosphor plates are used 20 times before they're disposed, but most often doctors don't um, choose to do that. So we're going to move along. We're going to look at healthy as far as crestal lamina dura. You'll see this thickened white area here. So this patient's not super old, which, you know, we're probably looking like they're in their early 20s, maybe late teens, 1920, 21. The unfortunate thing is, is we've already lost a first molar for this patient. And um, you'll see the large restoration that's in this particular um, first molar, which is probably indicative of what happened to this uh, mandibular uh, first molar as well there on the lower left. You'll also notice how large the pulp chambers are. This makes the patient um, kind of radiographically, we can determine they're in the uh, younger ages because as we age, our pulp chambers get smaller. So crestal lamina dura, so what does normal look like? And this is what you want to uh, picture as far as somewhat healthy bone. It's kind of horizontal bone loss and 
we know that from our readings that parallel to the CEJ is one to two millimeters below the CEJ. The CEJ is going to be in this region, okay, where the indicating marks are. And you'll notice that the bone follows the shape of the CEJ. That's very normal. Um, as we go through this series too, I may have to break this slide series. Uh, presentation up into different phases because I'm having trouble getting it uploaded into a YouTube so we'll have some part ones and part twos to continue with so beginner's guide again so cervical radiolucency burnout so what is that you'll know that this area of the tooth anatomically is much thicker than the necks what I call the necks of the teeth you'll notice at this this is the DEJ area, and this area is much thinner. So if it's thinner, the radiation that penetrates that generates a more lucent image versus the opaque, more opaque the, the image presents. All right, so what else does normal look like? Normal enamel, which is what we were just talking about, where you have the enamel, the DEJ, here you have the CEJ, excuse me for clicking that, CEJ, and then you have the pulp chamber. So let's talk about different classifications of caries because this is very significant. It can help you to determine the levels of needed care for the patient. So you have a class 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. You'll see how the lesions start out isolated just in the enamel, which what we would call would be an incipient lesion, right at the junction of the DEJ, just breaking through the DEJ, well into the DEJ and almost to the pulp horn or the pulp chamber, um, which can be very detrimental to the tooth. So we're going to look at this and radiographically it's very interesting to see it in an illustration, but you need to see it on an image as well. So um, Carrie's um, class one. You'll notice how it has these indentations like pitting in the side of the tooth. This is what we call incipient lesions and typically this is due to multiple things but primarily there's some sugar in the diet, lack of home care, interproximal issues, um, possible candy and or sodas typically is what causes this um, these types of lesions that we see historically. So a class three, you can see how it has just broken through the enamel. We have this lesion and it's starting to break through um, the enamel. Class four, where it is definitely inside. See how this one was the class three? It's right at the edge, almost breaking through. And here it's full blown broken into it, but not yet to the pulp chamber. And we're going to move on here where we have a class one incipient lesion, class four, much deeper, and class threes where it's just localized right at the DEJ. And then we have some occlusal caries also. A lot of times occlusal caries is much more difficult to see on an image. Um, it depends on the angulation of the film, the quality of the image in their positioning aspects. This image was taken very parallel. They focused primarily on interproximal spaces, obviously, because there's no apices, so this was not intended to be a periapical. Um, all right, caries and periodontal disease. This is where we live. Um, you can see that this patient has some beginning stages of periodontal disease where we have some vertical bone loss aspects occurring vertical where these are more horizontal. You'll see this is this is somewhat vertical, but we want to be sure to make note also. And uh, as soon as I click, it'll add some highlights for you. But this is calculus on an image. Do you see how this fuzzy look looks right here? That's a piece of calculus as well. So here we have um, more, more calculus. Keep on going. As we approach to the anterior portion of the film, this image as far as anatomically, this portion of the patient's mouth is thicker. 
you'll notice too as it progresses forward premolars are not as thick as a molar therefore you're going to have some possibly 